And uh, the next. Yep. Like I mentioned, uh, the next couple of sessions will uh, still be in the Zoom until we figure out another alternative, but yeah. So this is going to be our running notes and let me open this guy for a second. It's just our regular uh, ritual to just see. Oh, okay. Okay, we got around five responses. Let's check out the latest five. Um, I'm not able to open previous recordings. Maybe this is a, okay, okay. from 130 is ours, I guess. Okay, it's an empty response, empty. So far, good. Okay. Domain is selected. I'll talk about the domains in a bit. But it starts a bit early around 8 p.m. CST. Okay. See about the things that we prepare. Points to the session now. We'll be happy if we continue the same way. Okay. General ETL using Python. Okay. Yeah. Okay, fine. There is no negative points so far. Um, yep, uh, welcome again, uh, everybody, uh, to our official first session. And let's rename this guy. This is going to be our uh, running notes as, as we discussed. But if you had not gone through this demo session, I would recommend highly to go through this uh, the session that I shared the recording in the group already in your uh, corresponding groups. So that session is no more than. 35 ish minutes. So it, uh, the on and off, it would sum up around 30 minutes. That's it. So we will discuss in detail about what we have discussed in detail about what we have covered and um, how the sessions will be uh, drilled down into three different um, segregations. And this entire stuff is related to the running notes about uh, that session itself. Cool. So today uh, we are going to start with a uh, programming language. And we choose Python because uh, it connects the, thought, the dots between various domains, okay? So uh, if you are getting the requirements, so uh, programming language expertise is part of the JD and it is one of the crucial part. So they might be looking for uh, Python dev or .NET or Java or Ruby, right? But if you keep this aside, as a programmer or as a software engineer, let's say, uh, we, you are expected to get yourself in line to a specific JD that is data engineering. Uh, just a second, guys. I need to... Thank you. I need to send the link to someone. Just a second. Okay, sorry about that. So the JDs in the market would either fall under data engineering category or microservice developer or a full stack developer, or it could be a, a simple application developer. The application dev falls either under this or this or a normal application that includes monolithic or uh, service oriented arc. So, but then uh, end of the day, these three are very much similar. And you may also get uh, application uh, the JDs on data analyst or BI dev, business intelligence developer, or it could be reporting dev, reporting person, right? Or reporting or visualization. or it could be security related, automation engineer, or 
it could also be a database admin slash DBA slash or, or database architect, anything that is related to database, okay? And then uh, we also might be getting something related to data science, but we already uh, spoke um, in detail. We will not be dealing with data science for a reason. Data science expertise needs uh, the folks to be at least having uh, sufficient you know, uh, information or knowledge or experience uh, to understand the concepts of data science. So we took uh, the data science sessions for around three to four sessions continuously, but then uh, we decided to pause for the freshers for a reason. So we will not, but yeah, uh, talking about the JD, right? So it could either, it could fall under uh, one of these categories, right? So uh, just thinking if I talk, I can, yeah, the main thing, DevOps or now it nowadays it's called as DevSecOps or SRE, it's called as Site Reliability Engineer. Okay, so again, these two are very much similar, but very much different in the functionalities. The technical stack will be similar, the functionalities will be different. The work you do with those two uh, skill set will be different, right? So in all these areas, these are called functional domains, right? So I'll have to uh, take, away these things and then just rearrange these guys because consider these are very much relatable to each other that's it okay and in all these jds uh, like i just mentioned one is programming language and the other is domain expertise. Uh, and the other is functional expertise. Okay. So we'll have to discuss on these three things in detail before we enter into a specific programming language. So for a specific JD, uh, uh, the, the, the three parts of our, um, our sessions, right? One is the language, programming language. The other is cloud, and the third, third one is real time, right? So when you get a JD, these three things are equally important, such that you need to match your skill set with these three functional parts in the JD. If you have any sample JDs, you can you feel free to go ahead and look into that. Every JD should, if at all it is prepared well, it should talk about these three different things. Okay, so I can just open one, for example. So it talks about PMO analyst, right? And then the framework. Uh, okay, since it is PMO, you cannot talk, you cannot see any programming language. It's not a development job. You see this JD, right? It talks about the BMO cloud platform, core and shared services, uh, scalability, security. This, this is all talking about the relevant cloud services, okay? And it is also talking about network and data storage components. And the cloud environments it is talking is in AWS, right? And then it also needs uh, operating systems like Linux, Windows, or whatever. and the proficiency in CLI, AWS CLI, Azure CLI, CDK, which means this is talking about Linux platform expertise and obviously Terraform. It's kind of a language, but it also mentions about the programming languages to be comfortable with, right? And then um, it's a bank, it's a banking sector that you need to have exposure or experience with. So my point here is uh, you need, a programming language in a JD, and you need a domain expertise. A domain expertise is one of these, right? 
And the functional expertise could be banking sector or finance sector or marketing sector or uh, e-commerce, edutech, right? So these are all functional expertise. So if you are an expert in Python, let's say, and React JS, and you can build the expert uh, applications, full stack applications, uh, and write, uh, within a few uh, days, let's say, uh, you still may not be an ideal fit because if you had not built any banking application and if the requirement is for banking, let's say, you cannot connect the dots. You have the ability to build the application, but you cannot add your experience if you do not have any experience with banking domain. So you, you might face issues with the dependencies in the platform, dependencies between the microservices and its communication and the payment gateway platform and the uh, data security features that you might not have worked before because banking has a lot of security uh, issues while you're developing applications, right? Let's say I'm just giving an example. So these three are equally important and we will uh, first, for the first few sessions, we'll be concentrating on programming language and then we will um, come to the cloud and then we will cover these two things in a combined fashion, okay? So how do we split the sessions? Again, I've, I've explained it um, in the demo uh, session. Feel free, feel free to go through that, but yeah. So our first few sessions will be on Python, okay? Cool, with me so far? Cool, I take it as yes. Um, again, just as a disclaimer, at the end of the session, feel free to send a feedback about this particular session or any other feedback that you want uh, to push. Uh, the form is available in this sheet at the top right, top right. So utilize it to communicate uh, with me or anybody else. It will be anonymous. You'll not be named. I will not be knowing uh, who sent those feedbacks. We said that, okay? Cool. Now uh, let's talk about Python as a programming language. And before we uh, talk about Python as a programming language, its installation, its features, we need to talk about why Python for a few sessions, okay? So my end goal or, or a generic uh, vision about having these sessions is to hit as many requirements as possible, right? So if you take all these domains, if you take data engineering, it is a skill set that is a combination of uh, Python and SQL with a database, all right? Again, there are multiple types of databases. It could be a relational database. It could be a columnar database, or it could be a MPP system, uh, which is similar to columnar or NoSQL database or big data environment, it doesn't matter. But the data engineering nowadays is a combination of any, uh, one of the specific Python frameworks and a SQL and a database, right? It is essential there. For a data analyst, also there are use cases or situations where we will be using Pandas or a normal SQL or a data analyst also might be working with um, reporting tools like Tableau or Power BI. But when it comes to Python, I'll just write Python based here, something called as Report Lab, or there is a Tableau integration with Python as well, Looker integration with Python as well, but yeah. So for BI Dev, it is a traditional ETL tools like Informatica. So uh, nowadays Informatica also has a Python extension. Uh, but you can automate most of the ETL tools using um, Python. For example, I'll share you a code snippet where we have uh, generated a package called as driverless ETL, which will automate all the uh, Informatica development. Okay, so it's just a web scraping module because every Informatica ETL is XML file. If you do not know about Informatica, it doesn't, you, you don't have to worry about it. Just know that there is a lot of automation that we can do using Python for the existing traditional BI tools, business intelligence tools. So report lab can be used as a complete alternative or a replacement for a traditional Tableau or Power BI, right? So even for a database admin, for every database, there is a Python module, okay? So for PostgreSQL, we have uh, PsychOpG8 or PG 8000, even th that works for Redshift as well. And uh, for Snowflake, there's a Python Snowflake connector. Then for Teradata, we have Teradata module itself for Python, right? So we, we can um, communicate with the database using Python. For data science, 
Python is one of the best competitors out there. Uh, R and Julia has been uh, different market leaders, competitors for Python, but yeah. So my point here is, uh, I'll just come to my point. Maybe uh, for microservices architecture or full stack for application dev, all these three categories, we can either use Flask, Django, Fast API, Udo, right? All these frameworks, they compete within each other, okay? So you can uh, also go with Node.js or Java-based uh, utilities or any other thing like .NET or whatever, but yeah. So like this, my point is if you know Python, if you call yourself as a Python developer, you can correlate your experience of being a Python developer with all these frameworks essentially, most of these frameworks, or in fact, all of this, okay? In current day scenario. So it means you're turning your requirement, or you're turning your skill set, your capabilities as uh, according to your JD, right? So it's a matter of the try. So I can bid for this position because I am not zero in this JD is what you can definitely tell the interviewer or the vendor, right? So you will be uh, in a position to convince them. For example, uh, you have a generic resume built and the, the requirement is for data analyst position you got a call from the vendor, you can definitely say that you have used the Pandas module or, or Report Lab module uh, to build some certain dashboards and worked as a data analyst or business analyst with the integration of Python just because our platform is using Python and it's our standard. So business analyst or data analyst does not necessarily have to have experience with Python, but yeah, in your customized setup, it's an add-on skill set that you possess so that's why you're seeing a lot of Python in your resume, but actually you are an analyst. So you can turn the tables, cook a story, build a summary in such a way that they will screen your profile and pass it through for the interview. Because for if your target is to get placed, your first checkpoint or a breakdown in that journey is to get qualified from your vendor rounds. Your vendors should believe that you are a potential candidate for this role. What happens after that is a different deal, okay? What happens after uh, you get uh, through the interviews, it's completely different context, but your point is to have some generic thing that can justify all the points in the JD or at least few points in the JD. So there's a potential match of around 50 to 60% in the JD. Yes, I can definitely, uh, bid this guy for this uh, role is what the vendor should think, right? So that's why we chose a very generic programming language and that is Python. Now, uh, since we know why we choose and what we choose and what we need to discuss, I'll just take a gap of five seconds for any follow-up questions so far. If there is no response, I'll take it as no questions and then I'll continue. I believe everybody is with me so far. Okay, so Python is a dynamic programming language and it has its own customized features and it has its own reasons why it has been famous, uh, famous market leader um, when compared to all its competitors or alternatives, right? So a very short and crisp story about how Python started. Uh, I tell this to every batch, uh, in fact, we definitely have a reason to know. And the story starts like this. There is some guy called as Goda Van Rossum. This guy is the godfather of Python. So he is a expert C developer, all right? So he's an expert in C language and back in 80s or 90s, right? So late 80s. Uh, he started working on C language as a developer in some random company. And he was so dissatisfied with his life and he was so upset with what he's doing. Why he's upset? Because uh, he is doing... Uh, I heard a voice, but yeah, okay, fine. If you have any question, just feel free to block anytime, okay? Cool. So. Uh, Guru Van Rasam has this C expertise and he's doing good job in his uh, environment, but 
there is a level, right? So there is a certain point, you call it as a checkpoint in life. So when you are, when you're not in a position to figure out how to write a code, you will have different level of problems, different kind of problems. So he's now an expert. He can write the code without thinking about any algorithm or anything. So he can just frame the algorithms. Now he has issues with C language because in those times, there are a ton of bugs in C. There are a lot of restrictions with C language where uh, you wanted to do something and you cannot do it. And he raised a lot of bugs. Even today for any programming language, even for Python, you can raise a bug. There are thousands of bugs we are dealing with and it's an open source and anybody can take those bugs and anybody can become a contributor for Python. It's that easy, right? So now uh, this guy raised a lot of bugs and he's waiting for the C dev team, the, the core team of C language to fix those bugs. He waited for days and months for a few things and it took years also for a few bugs to get resolved. Some never get, got addressed and he was so very frustrated. So he was like, my point is I raised a genuine bug with a programming language that I am in uh, uh, need of I'm, and I'm working with it from so long time. And I know that this needs to be fixed and I cannot fix it because C language is not an open source, right? So I'm, I being a single person facing all these issues because of the dependency and because it is not open source, how about the others, right? Every, most of the developers who reached the checkpoint of figuring out the code has these issues or restrictions with the language, C language at that point of time. So he felt the pain and he thought to create a new programming language where he does not hold any right or ownership to lock the code. He wanted an open source to be in the market and he started creating wrapper functions that are based purely on C language. So for example, um, if you want to print something in C language, let's say you do with println, let's say. So uh, I'm just giving you an example, right? So instead of println, let's make it as a print because it is more human readable, right? So, right? This makes more sense for me, is what he thought. And he incorporated it as a wrapper function and then he made it available. And he called that language as Python because he's a big fan of Monty Python program. Uh, it's a sitcom during those times. He used to watch that. So he then generated all the wrapper functions and released or published his first Python um, framework or a new programming language in the market, which is a huge success. It is a huge success because, not because of the functionalities and his expertise or whatever. He just released a lab rat right? A basic version. But the only good thing is that there is Java, there is .NET, there is C at those times, right? These three are the major competitors uh, during those times. But his Python stood above these because of only one reason. That is none of these are open source and this guy is an open source. He's like, yeah, I released a version available for everybody. Please feel free to suggest and modify anything. But the publishing will be done by authorized team after reviewing it, all right? So now it has spread across the globe like plague. Now all the C developers, C language developers has got a solution for all their worries, right? So now if C core team is not fixing my bugs, I will fix my own bugs via Python, right? I'll switch to Python and then I'll program it. I'll be a contributor and then I will expand this language. All is well. Everybody is actually super happy with uh, this initiation. And this is called as Python or C Python. And then after a few days, by seeing this huge success or stardom of this programming language, the .NET guys got the moment and even Java guys got the moment. They are facing the same issue, right? So they wanted to have a similar framework. Why not we, if C guys has shown their frustration in the form of this solution, we also need to have the same thing in place, right? So they created, again, instead of creating a, something else, they have created another Python, okay? So this is called as, <coughs> Python. So a Python with Java wrapper. 
as a base is called as Python. And .NET guys also created something called as Ion Python. All right. So now this is a collaboration, collaborative work from everybody, which also means that if something can be done with Java, can be done obviously with Python. Same as the story goes for .NET and C. Now it has got a super uh, set of all these three languages and it is an open source. That is the beauty of the background story why Python has become more famous and market leader uh, hitting the then traffic of the competitive alternatives, right? So having said this, uh, he's, he's just got an offer uh, uh, once once he got enough traffic, uh, his company CEO invited him to have a discussion. He offered him a big deal. He offered him a share in his company, provided that he wants to lock this programming language for good. He wants to own that programming language. His company wants to do that. But the whole intention of uh, Rossum doing this in entire initiation is that he want to make this programming language as an open source so that everybody can contribute. Everybody can work as a contributor and they can they don't they no longer have to be frustrated and wait for the bug fixes so he gently said no and the ceo of that company gently kicked him out of this out of his organization and he started developing the python programming language with his friends and folks in very old computer systems in his garage and here we go so after after um, after many years of improvement, development, extension. The, the, the core team of Python is now humongous. And there are no wonder if we are seeing each programming, each Python framework released every day also. You, you can expect anything that can be done because anybody can develop it or expand it, right? So it has just become a, a similar platform like Wikipedia. In Wikipedia, anybody can uh, open it, edit it, but it will be published only once it is approved. So same thing happens for Python. Um, that's why it is uh, standing as a market leader. So that's just a crisp story. And now let's come to the basic features that are worth knowing for Python, all right? The basic features of Python are It is dynamic programming language. Less number of lines comparatively. Okay. So this is a debatable statement because new gen languages like Julia is even more or less number of lines, but compared to the other established stable programming languages, it is definitely less number of lines. Okay. So that's that. And it's a high level language. We'll, we'll talk about each and every characteristic um, in a bit. But it follows a strict principles. There are many principles, but worth knowing for us in the interview standpoint is this. These are the two principles that it strictly follows. So DRY is, is, it stands for do not repeat yourself. Sounds dumb. This, the other one also sounds very dumb. You can Google it. There is a ton of material that I'm going to find for these two principles. KIS stands for keep it simple and stupid. So these are the two basic notions uh, under which Python has been evolved all these years. Every Python developer has to follow these strategies. So which means um, it strongly says or recommends if you are a naive non-IT guy, if you see a Python code, you should be able to understand it. So one very minor example is there's something called as Lambda functions in Python, okay? So when they were released, it's a kind of a revolution. These Lambda functions were not available at any other language. These are inherited from Python is what, uh, from my understanding, okay? But then Python uh, bringing those Lambda functions, which are anonymous functions, uh, which is a big deal at that time. But after a few years, Rossum made a statement. 
do not use lambda functions. We strictly ban these lambda functions just because they do not follow the KISS strategy. So these are making the code complicated. If I look at the code as a naive person who does not have any programming skills, I cannot understand this. So that's why we got a new alternative for these lambda functions called as comprehensions. Unless and, and uh, if there is no other choice but to use, only then you use lambda functions just because they are there and they are great. They're great at performance, they're great at flexibility, functionality or whatever, but still try to use comprehensions because they are more readable. We are preparing this code to increase the readability. All right. So that's how important these two principles uh, for the Python code developers. All right. So now, um, so again, another small story about the versions of Python. So he started with 1x version, right? So uh, Rossum went to 1.1, 2.1.2, 1.2.1, 1.2.2, blah, 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 blah. And then it entered at a point of time to 2x version. So at this point, there are, again, I don't remember exactly. It should be around 2.3 or 2.4, let's say. Just take an example. So at this point, there is a frustration again in the audience, the users or the contributors. Uh, the frustration is they are finding this language comfortable according to their needs, but the way the architecture is built on these data types, the way the data structures are defined are a bit off. So we need to change the architecture uh, so that we will achieve a lot of optimization. A new generation architecture, let's say. We'll talk about uh, what changes they did, but they tried to do all the changes and then they tried to release the next version. But when they did beta testing, it utterly failed because yeah, it did not fail in its functionality. They, they got the optimization, but the previous versions were not compatible. There are syntax changes one good reason, and the objects were decommissioned. Few objects were decommissioned. For example, there is something called as X range and there's something called as range. There's no point of using X range as an X range object. We will decommission the functionality of range and give the functionality of X range to range, which means, I repeat it, there are two the attributes intended for similar purpose. So they wanted to give the functionality of X range to the range functionality. They wanted to remove the whatever the range is doing. It is not optimized. It is not recommended to use. We want X range functionality to be mapped to range and remove X range. It is not more readable, not human readable compared to range. So now in the next version, we'll be having only one, one object that is called range. And that functionality of the range is equal to whatever we have for X range, almost equal, all right? So there are certain uh, changes, okay? So this is affecting the previous versions of Python. So that's why they released a new version of Python called as 3x in parallel to the existing 2x version, all right? So now they rolled back the changes. They made it as an independent version so that it will avoid the confusion. And then uh, with this, they have two parallel developments because at this point of time, most of the companies already inherited the 2x version of Python, and they are actually reluctant to make the changes. They do not want to basically make any more uh, migrations because let's say I'm using Python and it's doing its job. And if you say that there is more optimization that comes in my part, in my way, by migrating to 3.x version. That's not my priority. I have my product, I have my business, I need to employ, uh, uh, expand my growth or whatever. Whatever I'm getting the optimization right now is, it, it suffices my needs. I'm okay with it. I can push that migration to a later extent now backlog is what every company is to claim. Everybody requested to move to 3.x version, but nobody did it. That's the sad reality. Even uh, the Godava and Rasam tried a lot of different ways to request a different audience, but they are just lazy or they don't want to spend enough amount of money or effort on developers to do this migration. So Rasam did not like that idea and everybody has got this 2020 vision, right? Vision 2020. So vision 2020 of Python org 
for all is to decommission or stop supporting 2x version all right so it publicly announced around four years before 2020 that is 2016 i believe so they they gave us a deadline so you do not expect any updates of python 2x version after 2020 but still you feel free it is still going to be an open source 1x version also is an open source 2x version is an open source 3x also is going to be an open source you can do whatever you want under uh, 2x version of python all right and and uh, even though it's going to be an open source uh it, you will not see any improvements or publications or or new versions coming up from the python.org team all right so you feel free to do whatever you want with the language with 2x whatever you see from 2020 is going to be the final cool. so that's the the vision 2020 and you will only see the updates for 3.x version so after 2020 uh, at that point of time, we see 2.7 version, and that is the final version. There is no other update that you will see that you saw after 2020. Okay. So, but now we have, I think, 3.11. Uh, it's still in the beta phase or unstable phase right now, but yeah, you, you will see. Yeah, I have a hand raised. So if someone is uh, putting on their resume like uh, eight years of experience, is that they should be knowing from one uh, X or from two X as an experience from today? No, essentially not. That's a good question. So um, Python two, okay, maybe I'll just show you how it looks like. Python.org is the official portal, guys, for everything. So do not, I, I would recommend not to trust any trainers or blogs or vlogs or anything, YouTube videos or anything, uh, especially regarding Python, because it is an open source. Anything can change. Um, if not everything, anything literally can change, right? So if you go to this Python.org, it's absolute um, source of truth, right? That you can uh, trust blindly. So if you go to this, you see all the versions. So essentially, if you go to the old versions, okay, so 1.6 is at 2020, all right? Now, just a second. Yeah. 2.7 is at 14. So most of the devs, of this generation worked with 2.7, not even with 2.6. So during the times of 2012 is where you will be seeing 2.6. And Python is not a super famous or market leader. Even we, th those are Java times, I could say. Okay, Java times are .NET times. So you, if you have eight plus of years of experience, let's say you will be having experience with 2.7, just because that is still being utilized there, and then 3.x. That's it. Did I answer your question, Lena? Yes, thank you. Yes. Okay, cool. Um, so, having said that, uh, let's come back to where we stopped yeah so 3. Point, uh, something uh, 3.11 should be the updated version for us um and we yes we we will definitely have to uh learn about the differences between 2.7 to 3.x because in your 8 to 10 years of experience whatever the career so far right so you might be facing an ex uh, it's good if you faced a setup where you had to deal with 2.7 uh, version uh, because you will see a significant features uh, changes. But unfortunately, we will not discuss uh, the differences between these two versions as a whole uh, topic. We will discuss these in a better way. We will talk about the differences between 2.7 and 3, 3x version for every topic, right? So for example, if you're having a discussion on print statements or functions or strings, right? 
So how different are the strings from 2.7 to 3.11, right? So that will be included as a whole in the discussion uh, along with all the other basic properties uh, that we need to learn about strings or any other components in Python, right? So we will carry forward the differences uh, for each object. So we got you covered there. So we don't have to worry about that. And the running notes will obviously uh, note down all the points. Cool. Now, uh, let's go to this guy. So you go to python.org and go to this download section. Depending on the operating system of your laptop, mine is Windows. So it shows download for Windows. If you open the same thing in your Mac, it will show download, download for Mac. If you open it in Linux, it will show the same distribution. So it will dynamically recognize your laptop configuration or the operating system, and then it will suggest you the latest version of the module. But if you want to go to a different one, you can always check out this, all right? And for different distributions, these are the links. For containers, this is the link. We'll talk about what a container is in a different scenario, but not now. So we'll just have to download this, save it somewhere. Then before I do anything else, we're talking about installation, all right? So the installation part of Python depends on something called as environment variable. So there is something called as path variable. Um, if you're using Linux environment, let's say, or Mac environment, you'll be able to print that as a Linux command like this. Okay. So if you added the installation part, the path where you installed Python, the environment variable called as path, you will be seeing that path in here. If you see this, right? So you also see a lot of other stuff here, it's something related to RSA security or, or whatever. So this is a kind of a strategy that a latest gen softwares will follow. So they give you an instruction. The instruction says, if you install a software, you add it here so that I will know, the computer will know by checking this path, if that installation is added to this path wherever you install, because you have the ability to install Python in, at any place, at any customized path. That's a flexibility, but I cannot scan all the files, all the paths in order to find the proper Python installation. So you need to update the installation path into this path variable, environment variable. It applies to Python, it applies to Ruby, it applies to most of the new gen languages, even for uh, Scala, Java, kind of, right? So you update the installation path here and I will know that you have this installation and then I will be able to execute the code is what the operating system says, cool. So if you are in Windows, uh, you just have to go to the environment variable section. In yep. So in this path, whatever you are seeing is whatever you are seeing here. Okay. So that's that, but you don't have to recognize the path, copy it, paste it, update variables. No, you don't have to do that. All you got to do is close the kernels like terminals or git bash or command prompt or PowerShell or any kernel. Uh, because it will not be refreshed in the session if it is alive. Just make sure you close them and open the downloaded software. You'll be getting installed now uh, if you're uh, doing it for the first time. Since I already have it, I'll just get these options, customize, and in that, you just can opt for all. That's okay, no big deal. The 
important part is add Python to environment variables. For some people, you'll be getting it here in the first step of our installation. Some people will be getting it here, depending on the version, depending on the operating system, all right? So once you add Python to environment variables, which is a, which is a mandatory instruction, then just install it. And I'm not going to do it right now. And uh, it's very straightforward. When you click on the installation, it will just install it. There is no other options, no other buttons that you need to click. But once you install it, you will see an ID LU. Okay, I'm having 3.10, 3.10, right? So it's a default interpreter. And I also have 3.11, right? Can have multiple 3x versions, you can have multiple 2x versions. That's completely possible. You can switch between these two versions, between multiple versions, right? So that's completely possible again. Uh, I, I'll talk about that. How do you switch between the Python versions in a bit, in a while, in some time? But the indication that your installation is successful is that you will be seeing this IDLE. So when you open that IDLE, which is a default interpreter where you can execute anything, everything related to Python. So you can just see, it, it can act as a simple calculator, okay? So it does all the good stuff of calculations, the basic um, multiplications, additions, et cetera, et cetera. I just got a message. Do we need to specify path during the installation? No, the, all you got to do is, when you are installing, you need to click add path to environment variables and it will add the path directly. It will identify it and it will add the path. If you miss adding that path, then yes, you have to manually go to the environment variable section. If you are in Windows, you'll have to just search in the window tab button, and then you'll have to go there and then you'll have to update it. Or if you are in Linux distribution, you'll have to do it using the Linux command, appending a path to the, uh, the path variable, right? So that's a Linux command, but I would recommend not to mess up the existing variables. Uh, so you can directly uninstall and then reinstall. And while you're reinstalling, you can opt for that add environment add path to the environment variables. And I would request everybody to uh, rename yourselves to the names that you want to be called as. I got this message from C Patta, but I cannot call C Patta. So, so the, I hope I answered your question, right? Yep, you did. Please rename uh, everybody to whatever you want yourselves to be called as. That makes the session a bit more communicative, more flexible. Cool. So once you are done with the installation, you can minimize this uh, ideally, but you can use call MU. Uh, I mean, I'm just using git bash. It's one of the Python interpreter. You can call it as an interpreter. So you, you can literally use CMD. Okay. Let me just use CMD for now, make things easier. So I'll just go here and then say Python version, all right? So if you had executed this very same command before you install Python, it would have told Python not recognized. For example, you would have got this message, like instead of Python 2.2, it will just say Python is not a recognized internal external command because it's, it's not an, a recognized command. You'd be getting the same message for Python as, as well, but right now we have a proper installation, so you'll be getting the proper version, whatever you installed, okay? So depending again on the kernel you're using, which Python is effective on Mac and few Linux distributions, most of the Linux distributions, it will give you um, the location of installation, okay? So this is a Linux compatible kernel called as git bash. It can be executed inside a Windows machine. Uh, so it gave you a path, but in the command prompt, it throw an error, okay? So who Python? is effective in Mac machines. It is not effective on uh, Windows machines, but yeah. So these are just the options to check out, um, what uh, check out or make sure that Python is installed as expected. So I got another message from SRK. Compared 
to C, C, P, C++ and Java, how good is Python in terms of security from application development perspective? Yeah. Um, again, that is a highly debatable statement. In terms of application development, um, like I just mentioned, Python is completely open source, which means, uh, so uh, I'll give you an example, okay? So there's something called as private objects, protected objects, and public objects. Python also has those. So if you're developing an application, you have every right to make an object a protected so that it should not be accessible by other components. But Python does not believe in storing something secretively. I expose everything that you want. I do not store my source code. You can take the code, you can optimize it, and you can build a better version of it, is what Python truly believes, which means even the protected objects can be mangled. It's called as data mangling, which means they can be exposed. All right. So having said that, there are few remediations that you can implement and you can wrap around. And there are noticeable differences between the object handling and object-oriented programming concepts between C++, Java, and Python. But having said that, my summary would be if you know how to do python is equally secure than or equally or more secure than the other languages you just need to know the way to do it because it supports all the design patterns it supports all the advanced data structures and the best part is you can customize your data structures directly in python you can build your own you can use something called as monkey patching but yeah if you do not know how to do Security is always a problem with Python. I know it's a debatable statement, but yeah, it is what it is. So uh, everything can be secured in Python if you know how to do that. You need to lock the objects. Who? Cool. I hope I answered your question, Sarkey. Yeah, got it, thanks. Um, there, uh, I, I mean, again, uh, I'm just trying to answer your questions as they come by. If others are not understanding anything out of it, do not worry at all. Store this point in your own running notes and then shoot it after some time, let's say after a few sessions, if you still don't understand. I'm very sure you can understand all these concepts when we, once we discuss the object-oriented programming, but yeah. So uh, if you need clarification, feel free to ask a follow-up question always, okay? Cool, so we now know the basic commands about how we need to deal with uh, Python installation and everything. Uh, so this is just an introductory session, just a small story, just to keep you motivated or in, uh, to keep this session interesting, that's it. But yeah, this is uh, worth knowing and we need to know about the history of Python before we start um, anything, right? So in next session, unfortunately we have it's, it's already been one hour. It's, the time ran super fast. So we, we, we got to close the session today uh, with this. Like I just said, it's just an introductory session. So I, I usually leave the last 10 minutes of the session for follow-up questions or doubts uh, or any feedback. So since it is first day session, since it is introduction, we are not going to have that. There's a couple of minutes that I can give you, but yeah. So that will be all for today. We will continue with our installation and the basic instructions from the next session. So I'll stop recording and I'll open the session for questions.